Greetings, Corpse Clubbers, and welcome to another episode of Corpse Club Horror BFFs. I am one of your horror BFFs, Patrick Bromley, joined, as always, by my horror BFF, the managing editor of DailyDead.com, the author of The Monster Squad, and star of In Search of Darkness, the definitive <laughs> 80s horror documentary now streaming on Shudder, a woman of many titles, Heather Wixen. Hi, Heather. Hi. Did you really just call me the star? Who else would you call the star? <laughs> I think, honestly, like, my, I always light up when Barbara shows up. Listen, we um, all light up when Barbara Crampton is on screen. I know. Obviously. Plus, plus, Barbara talking about cocaine um, is just instant classic status, I think, for me. Um, yeah, no, it's weird because, like, somebody was like, they tweeted, and I'm not saying this because I'm, like, egotistical or anything, but it was just, I just thought this was, like, really funny and weird because they're like, oh, look at all these these iconic horror legends in this documentary. And there's, like, there's Jeffrey Combs and Barbara Crampton and Elvira and they shut and Joe Dante and Mick Garris. And then they, they threw me in there. And I was like, I'm yeah. sorry, what? You're I was a top like, what critic. are you even talking about? So I just, I thought that was really funny, but no, it's been, it's been really fun and really nerve wracking um, to see everybody's re- responses to the documentary. Um, I'm, I'm glad people are enjoying it as much as they are. I like the fact that people are actually watching it in tidbits you know, because it's, right. it's four and a half hours. So, you know, it's it's a big chunk of time to have to carve out. Um, but I like that people are sort of stopping and savoring it um, because I think that helps a little bit. Because I think once you get to the, like hour four, if you've been watching it from the beginning, it's you start to feel it. Not And that's not a knock, obviously, against the documentary, but it's, you know, four hours into a movie and you're like, all right, you know, it could be the greatest movie ever. And you're like. Okay, maybe we need a breather. Um, So I like that people are sort of, you know, doing little bits of it and savoring it and all that kind of stuff. So I watched it in one shot so I wouldn't lose track of the story. Ah, good. Yes, there's a lot to keep keep track of in there. It can be very confusing. I, you know, it's it's very plot heavy, so I get it. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's very cool that uh, it's on Shutter and that people are enjoying it and enjoying you so much in it. All I can say is it's really nice because I think um, the website Tees on Scene, um, which is where I purchased my Deborah Hill T-shirt that I wear in the documentary. Mm -hmm. I I would say that I think they've probably had some good sales this week because most of the comments that I get are people like, oh, my God, I love that shirt. Um, So I'm glad to be able to sort of pay it forward to them because I, too, love that shirt. It's a great shirt. I love Deborah Hill. And so, you know, if it gets more people to buy a Deborah Hill T-shirt, then I am ecstatic. Nice. So I'm just there to sell T-shirts is basically what I'm saying. (laughs) I will be your corporate shill. Thank you very much. I can't wait to see what shirt you wear in the next documentary. Oh, I don't I don't I see because I I had to step away from the sci fi doc um, just because of all of my other commitments and things going on. Um, And I know that they're doing a sequel to the horror, the 80s horror docs. I don't I don't know that I'm going to get interviewed it again to be really honest i hope i do um because i have a whole lot of more rambling i can do uh and there's a whole lot more movies that we didn't even get to touch upon really uh in that first horror doc so i i hope so i hope i get to come back um and if i do then uh, the, the pressure's on to up my t-shirt game once again i think you need a new t-shirt for every talking head that you do I think so. I mean, I there's, you know, again, I love the Deborah Hill shirt, but you got to You got to up your game, yeah. um, you know, because you're only as good as your last T-shirt, I think, as a horror fan. That is the saying in uh, in Hollywood. Yes, that is. And, you know, I live here, so I know about it. I know about all that. So. That's right. You're very plugged in. <laughs> very so, plugged in. So plugged in. I'm so I'm so plugged into everything. Would the sequel just be like the movies that they didn't cover last time? Probably. And I'm guessing there would be some some more of like an international focus. There is, you know, obviously a, a lot of films and a lot of countries that we didn't even get to touch upon. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously we need to do a quote unquote, you know, tour of Italy, as, as so to speak, mm. if you're going to go with some Olive Garden lingo mm-hmm. um, and get through some some Italian horror, which I mean, you should be there for that. Yeah, they probably need someone Chicago based uh, to to comment on some some of those films. Definitely. I think so. I think if you're thinking Italian horror, you definitely want to go with somebody from Chicago. I'm available in search of darkness. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Yes. By the way, can I just tell you that um, my favorite joke that you made from our last episode about Dennis Farina, uh, I just saw him in something else. And I just like 
literally caught him in my eye and I just started laughing because I just thought about that. If if you looked at a Chicago hot dog and made a witch, <laughs> get Dennis Farina. And I was just like, oh, it's, uh, Dennis Franz. Dennis Franz. Yeah. Sorry. I, why don't, I don't know. Why I always call him Dennis Farina? Um, it's just awesome. Dennis is with F last names anyway. But Who yeah, are I from just, Chicago I, and often play cops. Yes. Um, they really should have just like been a buddy cop show in the 80s. Yeah. Franz and Farina. Oh, my. Oh, my God. That even like rolls off the tongue. Yeah. France and Farina. We yeah. should make that into a shirt. You could wear it in the next documentary. I could. I could. Wow. All right. See how it now, all comes together. It, yeah, it we really got does. we got pretty uh we got pretty silly on our last episode. Let's not do that this time around. Yeah, no, we're we're gonna be very professional this okay, time good. around. Okay, good. Good. What are we Serious talking about this case. time? Uh, we are going to jump into Let Me In, which came out in 2010. Um, makes me feel incredibly old. <laughs> some of these movies. Um, I, I was actually really excited to, to jump into this one in particular. Uh, one, because Let the Right One In, um, the original film, means a lot to me. Um, two, because Let Me In ended up being so much better than it had any right to be, especially being such a recent remake. And three, this is this is how I know I'm old. But when I went to Comic-Con in 2010, they were doing a press line for Let Me In. Uh, and Matt Reeves was there with Cody Smith-McPhee and Chloe Grace Moretz. And I think Richard Jenkins was even there, too. Um, and they were like tiny little babies. Like both of them, both Cody and Chloe. And I was just like, they're like these two little cuties, like sitting on a, on a red carpet. And now they're like grown adults. Yeah, they're in their 20s, really right? Yeah, and I feel really freaking old. <laughs> um, but they were absolutely adorable and really excited um, and really excited to be at Comic-Con, too, which I thought was kind of fun. Um, but, yeah, I think uh, Chloe has kind of turned into something of, you know, I know we're not really using the Scream Queen moniker, but she is definitely um, throughout her career, even at a very young age, has sort of been a pretty awesome force of nature in genre films. So good for her. Yeah, she was in that uh, Carrie remake, which I didn't love, but that's certainly not her fault. Yeah, and she, you know, and she was in the Amityville remake. Well, right. she's in a lot of horror remakes, but what I always think is crazy about the movie, because she was like really tiny in that movie, and she did her own stunts on the roof. Interesting. Yes, she wanted to do it, and they let her do it. I mean, obviously, there were stunt people with her, but like, she's a little badass. You know, and obviously she did really great stuff and kick ass and stuff like that, too. But like, you know, she's she's been she's kind of one of the, the gutsiest little actresses out there. Um, and I don't know. I just respect that a lot. I have a friend who was uh, her stand in in the Amityville remake. Oh, look at you, Mr. Hollywood. <laughs> well, I'm just saying uh, I have connections and right. uh, the uh, In Search of Darkness should call me. OK, I will not put you guys in touch. I'll have their people call your people. They should be in search of Patrick. <laughs> That's going to be the name of my doc. Oh, I yeah. Do, I'll do a talk. <laughs> I'll, I'll connect with Erica and we'll get it all going. It'll be I great. like this plan. <laughs> It'll just be like us talking about like a bunch of different Toby Hooper things, which we should do anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, I agree. you know, I love it. I love everything about this. Um, but yeah, I. It's interesting because I, for me, Let the Right One In um, was a really special film for me for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, it was one of the first movies I actually ever saw at a film festival. Mm. Um, yes, I, it was my very first film festival that I ever attended was Scream Fest 2008. I flew from Chicago out to L.A. Uh, and was totally uh, overwhelmed, totally felt like I was out of my element uh, freaking out. Eliza Dishku said hello to me in the bathroom. Um, yes, yes. And she had a lot of side boob that festival. What? Um, uh, it was, it was hard cause she was like leaning over the sink and I was like, Whoa, girlfriend. Okay. Um, but she was very nice. I, I wasn't expecting that. Um, but it was, yeah, it was my first festival experience ever. Um, I had to save up a ton of, a ton of money and I actually used miles so I could fly myself out. Um, and so, yeah, and they played Let the Right One in that get year. Um, it was actually a really fantastic year for their first Scream Fest, because I believe that was also the same year that they did the special trick or treat screening. So imagine like being like a burgeoning horror writer person. Right. And two of the movies that you get to like discover like at your very first film festival are Let the Right One In and Trick or Treat. Not bad. 
you know, everything was kind of downhill from there. So take that Sundance. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, so I, 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 and I remember being just completely devastated and blown away by let the right one in. And then, you know, like most horror fans when they were like, okay, we're going to do a remake and for, you know, America. And I was like, what? Why? Why would you do this? You know, people, sorry, speaking of Fast and Furious, you know, people like to drag race down my street. So apologies there. Somebody is living their life a quarter mile at a time in your living room. They are, um, you know, it's 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 quarantine, you know, so we got to stick together. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was, I, you know, admittedly, I was pretty much anti remaking Let, Let the Right One In. And I honestly, even though I like let me in and we'll talk. Well, and I, I really, really like let me in. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that more. I still don't even know if we needed the re the remake. Um, but I still appreciate that it exists. I really like the performances and I, uh, you know, I mean, anything that puts Elias Coteus in it, like, I'm whatever, I already love it. Um, but yeah, I was, it was one of those where like many people, I was like, wait, why are we doing this? Um, and then it just kind of blew me away and I'm grateful that it exists. Yeah, it's a movie that I think never got a real fair shake in 2010 because it was so soon after Let the Right One In and because that movie is held pretty sacred by a lot of horror fans there was a lot of pushback against the idea of remaking it so soon and the idea was, well, they're just remaking it so that people won't have to read subtitles that was sort of the the claim being made about Let Me In at the time. And I agree that, like, the finished film probably isn't quite different enough to completely justify its existence. It adheres pretty closely to Let the Right One In in terms of beats and structure. Um, but I do think it takes a very different approach to the material and I think that the two can kind of coexist. This is a, going to be a very controversial statement. I think Let the Right One In is probably a better film, but I think the one I reach for more often is Let Me In. Yeah, I, I you know, it's it's interesting. I actually hadn't rewatched Let Me In. Actually, it's been a while since I rewatched Let the Right One In, too. Um, I actually watched both back to back which is really interesting because you do, I do wish that there had been a little more variation because um, I know that there are some things that didn't make it from the book into Let the Right One In. Mm -hmm. So I wish maybe they had gone back to the book right. and maybe pulled some of those elements into Let Me In to kind of let it stand on its own two feet a little bit. Um, so it's, it's an interesting experience to watch those movies back to back because you're like, oh, now we're at the scene where, you know, he gives her the Rubik's Cube and now we at the scene. Um, but what I did, you know, like, you know, at the scene where like he's going to offer her candy and she's going to vomit everywhere. Right. You know, it was so for me, it was it was interesting. Um, it was a very interesting experiment to sort of watch them back back to back. Um, but I think for me, what really sort of makes let me in stand out a little bit is the fact that they they sort of turn Richard Jenkins into more, less of a sad old man and more of something that feels like a serial killer. And it's so simple because they put a mask on him. And it's just that simple little like garbage bag mask or plastic bag mask that ultimately almost gives it a slasher vibe to yeah. it, which is interesting. Um, because then, you know, and let the right one in, it's just, you know, it's, you know, basically the father figure guy. Um, you know, he just goes and kills people without a mask, which I was like, wow, you're you were so not concerned about anybody seeing you. <laughs> um, it must be nice to live with that kind of freedom. Um, and so I think what I really appreciate about Let Me In is that you get a better sense of who that figure is. Or, well, I guess, you know, I, I don't even think he has a name. And I'm, I'm looking really quick if he has a name and let the right one in. Um, I can't remember. I... I don't remember, but I know uh, in Let Me In, I know uh, Richard Jenkins, his name is Thomas, even though uh, it's only referenced, I think, once in the movie. And she never calls him that. Um, I think it's like something you see like as sort of an aside. Um, but it's really interesting to me. But you almost get a better sense of who he is emotionally, I think, in Let Me In than you do than that character in Let the Right One In. Yeah. 
Um, and I appreciate that. There's like that moment of tenderness at one point when um, Abby, you know, played by, by Chloe Grace Moretz, like she reaches up and she kind of strokes his face and kisses him. And in Let the Right One In, like uh, Ely, she's very, there's just always a distance between those characters, um, which I'm probably gonna make some controversial statements about both st- movies down the line. Okay. Um, but I like, I sort of like that seeing that tenderness between Richard Jenkins and Chloe Grace Moretz, because I feel like it connects them a little bit better. Like you understand why he would stick with her for right, so long. Right. Um, and then let the right one in. I'd be like, Oh, you're going to be, uh, you know, you're going to be cruel and a bitch to me. Well, then I'm out. Like, go get your own food. So, um, so I think there's, there's some, some there's a little bit of a, a humanization in Let Me In that we don't get in Let the Right One In. Um, and I think maybe that's what I, I really sort of gravitate towards uh, in the remake. Well, I think on the whole, it's a warmer movie. Um, I think the cinematography is warmer and not just, you know, because we're transplanting the setting to America. I think the Michael Giacchino score uh, adds a lot of that. And I think, like you said, it's, it's the connections between some of the characters, I think are a little more deeply felt. I think it's a little bit more of a movie about, um, because I feel like let the right one in. It's a little bit about like a burgeoning sociopath and let me in is just more about a lonely boy um who finds a friend yeah i agree i think it's interesting that you mention that because it, it you st- when you start let me in you know you see owen you know practicing in his room like stabbing kenny you know basically saying what kenny says to him all right. the time the bully kid um and he's wearing like a, a very creepy sort of like see-through mask plastic mask and so immediately you get like the sense of like, oh, this kid is off. But it's interesting how quickly the movie backs off of that. Mm-hmm. Like they felt like it almost felt like they needed it to like pay homage to the original movie. But I don't think they did because they don't really give him sort of those tendencies. We're like in Let the Right One In. Oscar is very preoccupied with death and with killing because like he has scrapbooks about serial killers. Right. Which is a totally normal thing for a kid that age. Sure. Um, it's a phase. Who, we all go through it. Yeah. Says the girl who was obsessed with Vlad the Impaler. Um, so I clearly have an idea of what's what's normal for young kids. What um, was it but, about Vlad the Impaler that you were like drawn to? Well, one, because he was, quote unquote, the original vampire, so to speak. Right. But I just the idea of like putting people's heads on pikes was like mm-hmm. freaky. And then like, I just remember being really drawn to like the, 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 the illustrations of that. And I was like, Oh my gosh. So, and for some reason I can't watch cannibal movies, but you know, go figure. <laughs> well, plus you dig guys with long hair. That's true. You know, I, I, I fought it for so long, but you know, here I am. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's interesting to me that they sort of open with Owen being, very voyeuristic and very, you know, just, you know, struggling with with these uh, aggressive tendencies, but they quickly drop it. Like we don't really like we see him kind of stabbing the tree a little bit at one point, but that's it. Like where it's, it felt like it was driving the character of Oscar more in Let the Right Win In. And it made more sense to me, like why he would go with her because he was so it was almost like a a, wow we are really we're doing lap two now uh where it was almost like a clinical detachment in a way um where that kid was almost sort of removed because of all the things that he'd sort of experienced where like you know in let me in like yeah his mom was like a bible thumper and a weirdo um but he didn't you know she was still pretty attentive even though she was working a bunch and actually had a good relationship with his father even though he wasn't normally in the picture Um, but you could tell there was some sort of affection when they talked. Um, so it was interesting. I just thought it was like, they sort of, they, they, it felt like they were going down that path and then pulled, I think they pulled away. And I would, I'd be really interested to see if there was more of it in that, in that film and let me in that they ended up backpedaling on because maybe of like testing or something like that. Right. I, I mean, is there anything to this idea that, you know, we see Owen acting that way because, 
it's learned behavior from his bully. And then later on, we get to see the bully acting the way he does because it's learned behavior from his older brother. Um, and I, I can't, I don't see a real parallel between the Richard Jenkins and the Chloe Grace Moretz characters in terms of these. <clears throat> It's a cycle of abuse, but it's not uh, physical abuse the way it is on the Owen side. On the on the vampire side, it's more like an emotional abuse that we see perpetuating itself time and again. And then that's kind of where Owen ends up at the end of the film, that now he's in this quote-unquote abusive relationship with Abby. Um I don't know. I, I, you know, it's not a, it's not a one-to-one -one parallel, but maybe there's something to that. Yeah. It's interesting. You just sort of mentioned that. Cause that's, that's sort of the, sort of the controversial thing I wanted to touch upon. Um, that I was, was watching both films last night. You know, I think in the back of my head, like I'd sort of romanticized these relationships between, you know, Ely and Oscar in the original and Abby and Owen in let me in you know, because you want to, because you like these kids, even though, you know, there's there's a little rough edges to them. You still like them and you, you're you're engaged with them as characters. Um, but there's nothing there's really nothing positive about their relationships, really, because ultimately Abby steals him away to right. basically take care of her now for however long until basically he dies or no longer is useful for her. There's, that's not a romantic idea. In no. fact, it's kind of cruel. Um, well, we've seen how it plays out. That's the whole exactly. purpose of the Richard Jenkins that, character. Is like right. when 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 Owen looks at those photos and it's like, oh, he was my age once, and now this is what has become of him. He's plummeting out of a window with his face burned in acid. Um, yeah, we've seen how it, how it will most likely play out for Owen. Yeah, and it's interesting because some I was I tweeted about the pool scene in Let the Right One In last night, and somebody mentioned like, "Oh, I really wanted to see a sequel to it." And I was like, "But we kind of already know where that story is headed. Yeah. We know what's in store for whoever ends up taking care, you know, of these characters." Um, and it's it's interesting because you know so many people talk about like that relationship, like, and they they sort of gloss it and they make it you know sort of shiny and something that you know should be embraced and I actually was kind of upset by it these like reviewing both of these movies now oh, yeah. um and it made me really sad you know because it's like Owen you know again his situation like yes yeah, you know, I, I had to live with a bible thumping mom I turned out fine eventually you know and you just know that there's nothing but like pain and death in this kid's future mm -hmm. Um, and that makes me sad. And the same thing with Oscar. I mean, Oscar, again, it's a little different because he already sort of had this sort of core cold and calculated nature to him. So, you don't. it doesn't like it doesn't kind of hurt your heart as much like, ah, that kid's got it coming. Um, but, yeah, I just it's one of those things when people talk about like, oh, you know, the, re the relationship between these two characters, you know, and I'm like, oh, it's you know, it's 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 a rom like people call this like a romantic vampire movie in a way. And I'm like. You know, I don't think it is. And I don't think it's as, I don't think it's a coincidence and that at one point on the bus, Owen's reading Romeo and Juliet, right. which everybody calls like one of the greatest romances of all time. But ultimately, that's just a sad story about two teenage kids who end up dead. Right. Yeah, you it's know? very much a doomed story. They're watching it in class, too, at one point. Yeah. And, you know, so it's like. I, I just thought that, you know, for me, I, it, I was like, it felt like Reeves was really acknowledging the sad reality of what these kids have in store for them. Yeah. Um, it's as a, opposed to sort of, you know, making it feel like it's this beautiful thing. I mean, it's it's interesting to watch and it's engaging and it's incredible, but it's it's not a happy ending for either one of them. I, I mean, for vampires, yes, not for the boys. <laughs> I think, you know, the the mischaracterization comes because so many of the scenes are played as a young love story because that's essentially what it is. Um, and the score kind of underlines that it's very gentle and very sweet. And um, their relationship is very uh, touching, you know, the way that they get to know one another and sort of find 
find one another. And, and you, you really have to ask yourself, does Abby feel about Owen the way Owen feels about Abby? Because on the surface, you would say yes, because that's the way the scenes play. But we kind of know that Abby is essentially grooming him to be her new Richard Jenkins. And so how much yeah. of it is genuine? And in Let the Right One In, um, uh, Oscar, uh, you know, the way that that movie ends, it's almost like he's being fulfilled. <laughs> like this is his destiny. This is prophecy, right? It, right, the exactly. Like been the, he's been building towards this. And so there's something fulfilling about him finding a purpose for these tendencies that he's been feeling the entire movie. And I think let the let me in is a lot sadder because Owen is such a sweet um gentle boy. And we know that he is going to be, you know, sort of warped and twisted into becoming a killer. He's been manipulated into becoming a murderer in his future. And it's a it's a tragedy in that way. You know, that what what becomes of him. Um, and I don't feel necessarily that way about let the right one in. Now, there's all kinds of other subtext in Let the Right One In. There's a lot of uh, stuff about sexual identity that has been erased from Let Me In in favor yeah. of it becoming a more traditional coming of age, young romance, you know, which it is, again, on its surface, but not where it ends up. I totally agree with you there. Yeah, no. And I'm, I'm sure people would be like, what? But I just it's one of those when you just look at it, and you're like. Whoa. Okay. I was like, wow, I was not prepared for these feelings, but like, yeah, I, it was, it was when I came out of both of those movies last night, I was like, boy, I'm definitely sadder about how let me in works out than I was let the right one in, which yeah. feels weird. Cause it's essentially the same movie. Right. Um, you know, so, but I, I will tell you, cause I was taking notes last night and it was like also watching two movies back to back with like really infuriating bullies. I just wrote down in big letters. I'm like, I hate bullies. Um, because I, it was just it was like one of those where like my anxiety was at an all time high. Now, that's a controversial stance. Like, you know, yes. speaking of controversial positions. Yeah. I, you're, I but you're bullies. not afraid to go out there on, on a I'm, limb like that. And I admire that about you. I yeah, will. I, I will, will not I will. follow you out there on that limb. <laughs> Look, I'm just going to put myself out there. Um, but it's I think it's interesting to note um, in Let Me In, the bully, uh, Kenny, is played by Dylan Minette, who is in Don't Breathe. That's right. Yes. So I got really excited because I did not remember and that goosebumps. he was in this. Oh, yes. And goosebumps. Um, but yeah, I did not realize uh, that that was him until I, the first time I saw his face. And I was like, wait, is that? And then I quickly went to IMDb and I was like, it sure is. Yeah. It's, it's the, the, the good kid from, from right. Don't Breathe. I haven't revisited Don't Breathe since I saw it in the theater. I, I really want to. I don't own it, so I have to just kind of wait and see if it's going to pop up somewhere. Um, but I'd like to. I mean, you'd think I would own it because it is savagely unpredictable. The, I've heard that it is, and I can't remember where I heard that. I, I don't I don't know either. Um, from, from it what sounds like something it, top critics would say. <laughs> it sounds like something top <laughs> critics would say. It's true. Um, I don't know if they did or not, but from what I've heard, it's it is savagely unpredictable. So, <laughs> you know, um, that's way yeah. better than just being regular unpredictable. No, you just you, <clears throat> you want, you know, you really want to get in there and be unpredictable. You don't want to just float in being an unpredictable. You really want to make a statement with your unpredictability. So. My quote tweet was regular unpredictable, and I think that's why it wasn't picked up. I think that's that's probably why. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's how it worked out. That's maybe that's why you didn't get asked to be in In Search of Darkness. Oh, shit. Because you were just, maybe you were just regularly unpredictable. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what it is. <laughs> So you're gonna have to up you're gonna have to up your up unpredictable game predictability game. Why that was a mouthful to say. <laughs> Jesus. All right, all right, I gotta change. Go back to I need new T-shirts and I need to up my predictability game. There you go. Our unpredictability game. My unpredictability game, and then yeah. I'm gonna be in the sequel talking about Fulci. There you go, Fulci, Fulci all the time. Um, how was Fulci for fake or fake for Fulci or whatever? It is interesting. Um, okay. there are some good stories like his two daughters are interviewed and I never heard them interviewed anywhere. So that was kind of cool. I think it honestly suffers from not 
being able to use clips from any of the movies. Why would you be able to use clips from the movies? I'm not sure, but they don't. <laughs> it's, a do- so, it's a documentary, so yeah, it's, the rights shouldn't be an int- uh, uh, a problem. They then it was a creative choice to not use clips, and I think that hurts the movie a little bit because ah, oh, that's a bummer. It you know using clips from the movies would have provided greater context for some of the stories that they're sharing. Um, and there's a limited number of people that are interviewed. I still liked it because, again, it's 90 minutes of stories about Fulci that I haven't heard before. But. Uh, Be yeah. honest, uh, every time you see somebody talk about Dr. Fauci, do you think it's they're saying Dr. Fulci? I wish that they were. <laughs> I wish. Because there's been a few times where, like, I've been in conversation with, like, with Brian. Like, I'll say something and it's like, Fulci comes out. I'm like, no, Fauci. <laughs> so, you know, if only Lucio Fulci was in charge of everything, we would we would be. I don't know that we'd be in a better place. But, no, uh, our eyeballs would be in tremendous danger. Yes, but the rest of us would be fine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's a good thing we had that little aside. But I was curious because I actually forgot to ask you about that a while ago. So, yeah, it was yes. I mean, I liked it, but I did wish that it was like this is the definitive documentary on Fulci. And I don't really feel that way. I think that. So what is you're saying is you made. have to make. Yes. Yeah, so you have to make the definitive documentary on Fulci is what you're saying. In search of Fulci. Uh, yeah. I, hello. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. OK, let's do it. Let's go make this movie. I have multiple Fulci T-shirts I can wear. Nice. Did you get that Fright Rags one? Of course. Oh, God, I'm so jealous. I And I'm like, I'm just sort of new to the Fulci arena but i really wanted that shirt because i thought it was awesome so i'm jealous but yeah. that's awesome i figured you would so i couldn't not get it even though i get it it pains me sometimes to spend the amount of money on shirts that they charge yeah which you know you're, you're supporting a good company though oh so, i know you know so but i get it remember when shirts were like 15 bucks kind of back yeah. in the day yeah. Yeah, kind of <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, now that we got our old people rant about money <laughs> out of the way, I got that checked off the list for this week, this episode. We're good there. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm curious because like one of the things that I thought was really interesting and I guess I didn't realize like how different they approached vamp, vampir, vampirism, vampirism, whatever, <laughs> being a vampire um, um, in Let Me In versus Let the Right One In. I mean, obviously, Let the Right One In, it's a lot more natural um, and Let Me In. You know, they rely on some contacts and some, you know, crazy dentures. And, you know, she I know Ely in the first movie, she kind of has a little bit of like a quickness to her. But I feel like you see it a lot more in Let Me In. Like she like uh, Abby kind of turns into the vampires from 30 Days of Night. Yeah. Um, Are you are you good with sort of. Leaning more into the vampireness of the story, or did you do you prefer the more subtle approach? I that's one of the changes in Let Me In that I'm not crazy about because I think it okay. it stands out every time. I don't the, think the effect, the sort of she turns into kind of a CG jerky little cartoon scampering up trees and stuff, and I don't think it totally works. It it pulls me out and it feels. There are a few moments that smack of, um, oh, this is for American audiences, like that it's not so much a creative choice that's going to make the film better as it is like we need to punch things up a little because Americans don't have the same patience or attention span. Um, I'm thinking of like the hospital scene where the girl lights on fire and oh takes the nurse with her, you know. Like, <laughs> although I mi- admittedly I kind of cackled that the nurse <laughs> starts on fire. Like I was like, oh, that's what you get. I did enjoy the fact that she was sucking her own arm, though. Yeah, that was cool. That was kind of gnarly and fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, because it, again, it's like you know that scene's coming. So what do you do to sort of amp it up? Right. Um, so I'm okay with the nurse burning. You know, she, I don't know if you open the you open the blinds, you get what you get. It bothers um, me. The, the CG fire is not great, but it bothers CG me fire less. CG is never good. They really don't have that effect down yet, which is surprising because so many movies like depend doing, on it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, um, I think it was like, for example, like if I watch Halloween 2018, I feel like the house is really burning. Laurie Strode's house is really burning at the end. I watch Ma. 
also from Blumhouse. And there's a fire in that house at the end of the movie. And you can tell it's digital and it's almost enough for me to take it, take me out of it. Um, and which I'm just like, you guys are the same production company, just burn a house down. Like, <laughs> you know, you know what's going on or just take the plate of Lori's house, put the plate right, of Ma's right. house over it and, you know, impose them. Cause I, I, I kind of know that's actually sort of, it's a, that's a very dumbed down way to explain it, but it's, you know, it's similar to maybe how somebody would approach it. Um, I've seen yeah. Ma. I do not remember a fire at the end of Ma. I think wasn't there like a fire at the end of the uh, end of the movie? No, I believe you. I just don't remember almost anything about Ma. Oh, you know what's funny? I was uh, because I've had to I've been eBaying my life, um, and so I was going through like all of my old. Uh, I'm trying to think. I, I was looking really quick if I could see. Uh, yeah, there is a fire because she's pulling her her daughter out or something like that. Anyway. Um, but it was funny cause I was like going through all my, my press stuff. Cause I was just kind of like trying to consolidate and selling some stuff and all that. But I found my press mailer from last year from Ma where it was like a video, like, and where she like actually talks to you and it still works. So I spent three days, uh, singing, don't make me drink alone. Don't make me <laughs> drink alone. Still, still amazing. And I love it. So, right. um, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't understand how, we can create all the things we can create on screen, like characters and atmospheres and fire just happen. Like fire and blood are still the worst. I don't understand it. Yeah, which is bad news for horror movies. Yeah, it is because we, we need those things. Yeah. Um, so I, I would my, my kingdom for authentic looking digital fire. Is, is all I'm saying. But yeah, it, it, it's, it, and again, it's a really stark contrast when you just watch Let the Right One In. And I know they digitally enhanced the fire scene in that, mo- in that movie. Yeah. But they really set a dummy on fire in right, that scene. Right, right. So it's like, I don't mind if there's a digital enhancement, but you got to have something yeah. authentic in that scene to really sell it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was... I don't know that I love the, 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 the contacts. It just felt like, oh, OK, now we're just watching every other vampire movie. Like I'm I you know, I love my classic vamps. You know this. Um, but I also really like minimalist approaches to vampirism. Um, I like something like the Transfiguration uh, was a really great example of sort of exploring a natural mm-hmm. Uh, approach to vampires. Uh, there's a movie that came out years ago. There's 100 movies with the same name. Um, but it's called Midnight Sun, and it's like this guy who sleeps with a girl. She sort of infects him with this thing that turns him into, you know, somebody who has to drink blood out of, like, containers of meat and stuff like that. Um, but it wasn't like they got super vampy in it. Like, it was very toned down. And, I, I you know, I've seen the Draculas and, you know, the I, I love all vampires, but I think – in a case like this, I, I think I would have appreciated it a little more if they would have kept it more withdrawn, um, because I think there's nothing else in that movie that feels stylized like that. If that right. makes sense. Well, I also think it's a more powerful and horrifying image to see 12 year old, the face of 12 year old Chloe Grace Moretz bloodied and biting down into somebody there's a there's a remove when we add the contacts and the fangs and the the makeup effects it's not her anymore it's her under these prosthetics and makeup and it's not as disturbing i don't think and plus i don't even understand the logistics of it like at what point I just rewatched The Lost Boys and th- that movie does the same thing where it's like, at what point in the process do you switch over to your do your eyes change into your vamp persona? You know what I mean? Um, well, there's always been stages of vampirism. Like even if you look at like Fright Night, um, you know, Jerry Dandridge has various levels of being a vampire, which, again, I think might have been one of I, again, I don't, I'm not saying this definitively, but it's one of the first sort of instances I remember of that happening in a film where you're not just a guy with fangs. Right. Like there's a buildup to it. Um, so I think, you know, I think in that way, I think Lost Boys owes a lot to Fright Night. Yeah. Um, but that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, especially when you watch Lost Boys and Fright Night back, back to back. Which um, you just it's, did. Uh, it's, which I just did at the drive-in. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you. Beyond fest. Um, that was a dream come true. Like see fright night at the drive-in. Like who, who would do that? 
And I say this as I'm looking, I have a little um, Peter Vincent uh, action figure on my desk. So nice. I'm saying that as I'm looking at little Peter Vincent on my desk. Um, but yeah, I just, I, it's one of those things. I, it's funny because like, again, I grew up on classic vampires, like fangs and, you know, sometimes, con, con, you know, contacts or something to sort of give them some sort of physical distinguish, uh, distinguishing marks or something like that. And like with Let Me In, it just felt weird. Um, you know, I, and again, it's one of those, like, I, I was less offended by it, like in like 30 days a night than I was in this. I don't know how to explain that. Yeah. Um, but I will say, if nothing else, let me in and let the right one in proves that we need so much more horror in winter times. Oh, I just definitely, love, yeah. Yeah. I just love blood on the snow. Yeah. Says the psychopath. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was, watching, I was like, God, we need so many more horror movies in the snow. Um, I mean, we get to, we've, we've had a, quite a few, but I'm just like, wow. There is just something so interesting about that um, to me, just like visually. Um, we still need that snowy Friday the 13th. I guess we do. Why is wh- but why? I mean, I guess you can't do Halloween in the winter because you don't celebrate Halloween in the winter. But there's been some times where it's snowed in Illinois. Yeah. Early in October. So it's not impossible is what, is what I'm saying. You know, but that would actually require them to make a Halloween movie in Illinois. Right. Or, you know, actually acknowledge Illinois as it actually exists. But <laughs> that's, that's another digression for another day. Um, but, yeah, I was um, – yeah, that was one of the things I, I – how do you – do you – obviously the original – and I mentioned this, the original pool scene from Let the Right One In, um, I still think is one of the greatest scenes I've ever seen in modern horror history. Um, it's so shocking. It's so effective. It's so tense. It's like, you know, it's it's like uh, I was again, I was talking to people on Twitter last night about this, but it was like it's you know, I don't want to be cliche, but that that scene is 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 the epitome of like a roller coaster ride because you have that into that knot in your stomach. Like when you sit in the ride and then you like you start to hold, you know, much like Oscar, you like you're holding your breath in anticipation and then the anxiety and the fear set in. And then there's that like that sweet release that happens once you go over that first hill. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of didn't feel the same way and let me in. No, I don't. I feel like I, it's it's little, not staged as well. It's not. And I don't understand it because, you know, Matt Reeves is an incredible filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Um, his his cinematographer on the film has done a brilliant work. Uh, his name is Greg Fraser. Um, he did like Zero Dark Thirty. Uh, he's he did Vice a few years ago. He worked on he just did Dune. So obviously the dude knows what he's doing. Um, and yet I can't believe how m- mispaced. I don't even think that's a word, but let's make <laughs> it a word. How mispaced that scene ends up being in Let Me In. And it's a bummer because that's like the moment, you know, if you've seen Let the Right Win, like you're going to like you want to see what they're going to do with this. And it just it didn't come together for me as well as it does. I mean, not that it could have, but it's. I don't know. It just ends up being a little bit of a bummer. I mean, it still doesn't deter my love of the movie, um, but it's just one of those where, like, I just wish they'd taken their time with it a little more. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the, you know, it's it's a misstep, uh, largely in, in comparison to the original. You know, um, I remember when I saw... There's a lot of problems with Spike Lee's remake of Old Boy, but you wait the whole movie to get to the hammer scene and he kind of fumbles the hammer scene, you know, and you're like, well, you got to at least get that right. And that's kind of how I feel about the pool scene and let me in where it's like, well, you kind of fumbled that. It's not it doesn't ruin the movie. You know, it's not even a bad scene. It just can't really compare to what they did in the original um, can, I, can I tell you a fun old boy remake story? Always. Always. I actually did. I haven't seen the old boy remake, um, but I did do a set visit for it. And um, during the set visit, I accidentally t- touched Josh Brolin's butt. Oh, wow. Accidentally yes. in air quotes. Yes. Well, no, he backed up into me mm-hmm. and my hands are right there. And I was like, oh, dear. And yeah. I was like, oh, my gosh. Um, so, yes, I have touched. Bon- uh, th- I touched Thanos's butt. Thanos butt. Thanos butt before it was Thanos butt. 
Um, but yeah, I was like, oh boy. And it was funny because I forget who it was, but there was another female journalist standing next to me. She looked at me and I looked at her and I was like, oh shit. <laughs> that should have been your story. What it was it like to touch Josh Brolin's butt. Yes. So yeah. Um, and Colin Farrell once held my hand. So, you know, there's wow. that too. Look at you. Yeah. I'm going places. I'll tell you what. <laughs> so it called me love. So, you know. I, 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 after those things, I could have just left and I would have been okay with this career. So. <laughs> what, uh, another one of the areas that the movie does something different from the original that I'm maybe not crazy about. What do you think of it opening? Oh, yes. Kind of two weeks into the story. And then backpedaling to and go then to the beginning again. Two weeks. I, for the life of me, can't really figure out the narrative Why? function of doing that. Yeah. I don't know if it was just to, to be different because it, it's funny because in 2010, it wasn't like a ton of movies were doing that. Do you know what I mean? So in 2010, it may have worked better, like watching it when a movie came out. But now, because that's such a thing that so many filmmakers do these days, it just feels like a cheat. You well, know what I mean? Not movie, a che- I don't want to say a cheat, but like it just it feels unnecessary. When movies usually do it, it's to establish a sort of how did we get to this point? And then we back up to answer that question. Here's how we got to this point. But I don't even feel like that really works. Yeah, I think it was just to sort of change the structure a little bit. So it didn't feel like it was like a beat for beat remake. Yeah. Um, but no, I don't think it necessarily works. In fact, that was one of my notes too, where it was, uh, like what I I literally said, why do we do this? (laughs) Right. And that's the thing. It's like, again, it's not like it ruins the movie. It's not bad. It just, there just doesn't seem to be a reason for it. Yeah. Um, and it's so funny because like it makes choices like that, but then there's like these little moments of brilliance in here um one thing that i really loved was the the scene in the garage in the gas station which Mm -hmm. i think is really fantastic it's a really great set piece uh because you're just like you know richard jenkins is screwed he's in the back seat he's trying to kill this one kid who's trying to fill up his gas tank but now there's another kid in the car and he's like it's just he's gonna get found regardless of what's gonna happen he is gonna get found and i love the fact that right before he goes after the kid that's sitting in the car with him. The kid decides he's going to light up a cigarette at a gas station. God bless <laughs> 1983. And also playing on the radio at the same time is I'm burning for you, um, which is so <laughs> subtle. And I was just like, oh, Matt Reeves, you you cheeky bastard, you. Um, I really love that little touch. Um, and I also think um, one of the ways that I think Let Me In ended up sort of broke some new ground was the car crash scene. Oh, my you gosh. Know, because, first of all, it's astonishing to watch still to this day. It's it's incredible. But also think about how many movies went ahead and did that after Let Me In. Right. Because if I want to be I, again, I, I, I hate speaking in absolutes because I don't know for sure. But I feel like I remember there being a lot of press about that scene when this movie came out, because it was like the first time somebody had shot a car crash like that. And now it's become sort of a standard yeah. for those kind of scenes, um, which is interesting to me that this little hammer, you know, it's essentially a hammer horror movie um, ended up sort of breaking some new ground in a way. And I wish I don't know. I wish we got more of that um, instead of, you know, some of the stuff that we ended up doing. Did you just fall down the stairs? Yeah, don't mind me. OK, so, you, you know, like you, you sit on a chair, you don't like, you know, push it over. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> just making sure we knew how to sit on chairs. Um, but yeah, so it's it's really interesting to me that like we get sort of weird decisions, like again, like the two weeks later t- or two weeks earlier th- thing at the beginning, but then also we get this brilliant sequence with the car crash that right. ends up changing the industry. Um, and it's just it's weird. It's like I wonder. I'm wondering if that was like a studio decision at the beginning. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, but now Matt Reeves is like a big time director now. So he is, he's not, he doesn't he's making, talk to me He's anymore. making Batman movies. Good for him though, because like, come on, did you used to watch Felicity? I used to watch Felicity. I never did. I've never seen an episode of Felicity. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's probably why like you didn't really get into like Scott Speedman and stuff like that. No, I think the Underworld movies are why I didn't get into Scott Speedman. 
no, no, no. Don't don't you even you don't burn you. underworld movies. <sighs> Like they care. <laughs> no, they'll be fine without me. Yeah, they're they've been doing all right without you. Thank you very much. So take that. Uh, no, but I have been a fan of Matt Reeves since The Pallbearer, which is a movie that I like oh that my, very my God, few I saw people it in like. Theaters. Me too. Oh my God! Why I I remember literally seeing that with my ex in theaters because of David Schwimmer yeah. of all people. He's oh. kind of what's wrong with that movie. Cause I think that's a good movie, but Schwimmer's a little much to take in it. Oh, he is. He is. I, you know, it's really funny. Um, you know, growing up, like I, I, th- I had a, I had, you know, I had a crush on David Schwimmer because of friends. And now I like when it, like as an adult rewatching friends, I was like, he is the absolute freaking worst part of friends. Yeah. He's insufferable. And he makes me so angry. And I get so angry every time I think about how that show ended and how Rachel gave up her dreams for some stupid mopey guy who like wanted her to give up her life and her opportunities just to stay in New York for what? Because he got her pregnant. Sorry. I'm just, I, I still get really angry about that. I see like that. Rachel should be living in Paris with her kid, living her life. And if, if Ross wants to come visit, fine, buy a ticket. But let Rachel go live her life. He didn't deserve her. So, but mm-hmm. yeah, I remember the Paul Bear. I saw that. I think that was like on Christmas break. I want to say when I was in school. I don't Did remember come- what time of year it came out. I I don't feel like it was around Christmas time, but I honestly no. don't remember. Oh no! You know what? That was when I was home from summer break. Um, okay. So that was between freshman and sophomore year of college. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But I do remember going and seeing the Paul Bear in in theaters. It's interesting because it seemed like Matt Reeves kind of got put in director jail for a while. Yeah, he didn't do much between that and Cloverfield, right? Uh, He did The Yards, which I never – with with the Wahlberg. That's a uh, Matt Reeves movie? I've seen that movie. Uh, he wrote it, oh, I guess okay. I should say. Okay. Um, but he wrote that and then basically like he did, you know, obviously he was doing Felicity at the time and he did some television, but whew, thank God for Cloverfield. <laughs> and then he made those sweet Planet of the Apes movies. Oh, so good. Yeah. So good. So good. Thank you, Matt Reeves, for the for the Planet of the Apes movies. I know he's listening right now, so. This is a, no, it's a really well-directed film. I, I love the direction. Um, there are just these little touches here and there that I question, you know, like, oh, why did you have to do that? And in most cases, it's so funny because I feel like the, the knock against this movie is it's not different enough. Um, it's just a cover version, but the cover is too similar. And... Yet it's the areas where it does try to distinguish itself or differ that I find myself being like, oh, why'd you have to do that? You know, like, why'd you have to do the CGI with when when she vamps out? Why would you have to start two weeks later? Um, Yeah, I think it's saving grace. I think is the car crash is sort of. the. Oh, my gosh, that car crash. Yeah. So it's so amazing. yeah, they could literally just write a whole course like in college and like film school about that car, that car crash. Well, and Richard Jenkins, who's like one of my favorite actors, is so oh, so good. He's not even in the movie that much, but he makes every single second count. Uh, just playing the saddest man alive. He's his eyes are so him? sad. <laughs> uh, when when he just says, "I don't want you to see that boy ever, boy ever again," and it's yeah. just like, oh. You're like, don't go see that boy, Abby. Just listen to Richard Jenkins. Right. Um, yeah, he is. Is that jealousy or is that I don't want that boy to become me? I think it's both. Yeah. You know, I think it's I think it's the jealousy, you know, which is, you know, obvi- it's, you know, you would expect that. But I think there's a wisdom, you know, that he's gained from his experience where he knows like what that little boy's life is going to turn out to be like. And maybe he wants to spare him from that. But eventually somebody is going to become that person. Right. So, you know, it's it's interesting because, like, uh, I think it's because, like, with what we do in the shadows, I think I've just grown to love Guillermo on that show so much as sort of the the caretaker. Um, And I don't think I don't think vampire caretakers get as much love, get enough love. So I think Guillermo is kind of push that door open a little bit. <laughs> so I think it's time for all the vampire caretakers to come together and get their moment. Like, come on, Billy Cole. 
you right. know, come join the party. Right. You know, and let's just get in here and let's just, you know, let's, you know, on uh, what's his face? Um, Straker from Salem's Lot. Let's, right. you know, let's have a little party celebrating the vampire caretakers of cinema and TV as well, I guess, if you're going to be, you know, oddly specific about Salem's Lot. Um, what, but yeah. what species is Billy Cole? He is a ghoul. OK, if you if you would have read my magazine that I wrote about Fright Night, there was uh, a lot to read. Ago. Yeah, it was five yeah. years ago. Yeah. It, yeah. I know it's like 30 pages, so I know that's that's, that's, that's <laughs> a much, lot. I get too it. much I for get me. It. I get it. I know there's a lot of words in there and not enough <laughs> pictures. Um, yeah, he was. I remember talking to Tom once. He was a ghoul. OK, um, so he's 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 just sort of a creature, but he's he's not a vampire. He's just sort of an in-between guy. Yeah, that's kind of what I always to... guessed. But I. Yeah, I knew if somebody knew it would be you. Yeah. So that was he was he was a ghoul. So which makes him different from somebody like, say, Straker, because Straker. And then obviously there's a lot from Fright Night that borrows from Salem a lot. Yeah. Um, but Straker was obviously human. Right. Um, just sort of a super enhanced human because he was very strong. So, which is interesting because you remember he picks up um, Susan's father, uh, the doctor, and right. puts him on, you know, to, you know, a little homage to some Texas Chainsaw Massacre up in there with the, the animal carcasses and stuff and throws him on the uh, horn or the, <laughs> the horns. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So anyway. Um, but yeah. So anyway, I love vampire caretakers. We need more of them. Let's bring that back. All right. I want it. There was some other change in Let Me In that I wanted to comment on, and now I don't remember what it was. I'm sorry. I've, I've gone on so many tangents no, today. No, it's but okay. It's, I get really excited when there's vampires to talk about. <laughs> I don't think we've really talked much about vampire movies, so. That's crazy. I know. What is wrong with us? Because we keep doing all these remakes. <laughs> this, uh, Yeah, right, exactly. But this is definitely, like, of the last 10 years, one of my favorite horror remakes. Um I'm yeah, trying it's to, I'm trying to think of one I liked better. Rush. Yeah. One that I liked better. Um, there probably is one. I just can't think of all of the horror remakes. I don't right know. Now, I but. love Child's Play. So I, I'm, I'm sort mm. of keen to that one. I enjoyed um, a lot about it, but I, I wouldn't put it above. Um, let me in. Well, you've only got a year's perspective. on True. It. See, how, see how you feel in like nine years. Nine years. Maybe I'm coming around on it. All right. So we're recording our episode in nine years. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Are we still going to be doing this in nine years? <laughs> I don't know. We'll all be dead by then, I think. <laughs> That's true. I think we're all going to be dead. Yeah. So podcasts are like the only form of currency in, <laughs> in 2029 where we're just like, you know, that's how that's, you know, it's, it's barter town, but with podcasts, <laughs> um, you know, because everybody has one now. So I think we could do that. I think we could. I think that would be a thing that yeah. would happen. Um. Yeah, I'm trying to think of like re recent remakes, like Evil Dead. I would put uh, up there. I would, I, I would actually put Evil Dead above Let Me In. Uh, I might too. You love Suspiria. I do not. Oh my God! Yes. Okay. There you go. I would put the Crazies up there too. Crazies was good. I think I like Let Me In better. I, I. I don't know if I can compare them because they're such different experiences, but I would watch the crazies more. Oh, OK. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, if we're going to go controversial Fright Night remake. What would you what would you where would you put that? Uh, not anywhere near. Okay. Let me in. Have you revisited? In I have a while, not. Uh, no, I, okay. I saw it in theaters and that was it. OK, I, I feel like you should try to give that a shot. Well, next year we'll give, we'll give it a shot again. I suppose. Oh, shoot. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. Is that uh, what our show, is that what horror BFFs has become? Just the we're remake just show? Remakes. We're the remake show. Remi re we'll be the remake remix. Um, what about Maniac? Um, I don't love Maniac. I appreciate it as an exercise. I don't love it. Yeah, sorry. No. Sorry. sorry. Oh, no. What about Rob Zombie's Halloween? <laughs> I like sorry. that movie. <laughs> so... <laughs> I like half that movie. Uh, yeah, I suppose I like half that movie, too. I, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of like other ones that we've had. I mean, obviously not Prom Night. Uh, I'm no. trying to think of like recent remakes. Would you would you put something like Quarantine up there? 
I've never seen Quarantine. I've seen Wreck, but I've never seen serious? Quarantine. Yeah. Oh man, there I don't know. Like After I saw Wreck, gnarly... I felt like I didn't need to see Quarantine. Um, there, there's a Plus few I'm little living deviations. In... Yeah, that's true. You, it's, this isn't the right time, I think, to watch Quarantine if you're feeling a little antsy. Um, I watched it last October for the first time in a really long time. Um, because back when I used to work for Rob Hall, he had just come off of quarantine. Um, and there is a super, super gnarly leg gag in that movie that I, I'm still in awe of. Uh, a lot of people used to talk about, like, Rob was just basically into doing gory kills and, you know, wasn't really into pulling off, the, quote unquote, the magic trick, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and this leg gag that they do in that movie with Jonathan Sheck is, like, a, insane. It's insane. Um, I like quarantine a lot, though. All right. Well, you sold me on it. I will check it out. All right. I, again, I don't know if it's necessarily the right thing to be watching right now, but, you know, <laughs> if you're feeling a particularly optimistic one day, there you go. Now you got your movie. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of, like, other recent remakes. I mean, obviously not The Hitcher. That's probably not a good one to go with. And I'm, like, one of the five people who liked The New Grudge. Um, I didn't but I see would, it. But let me... I would put Let Me In before The New Grudge. I like The New Grudge, but okay. I think I'd put Let Me In before that. But yeah, I'm trying to think of like, wow. Well, the whole remake trend has slowed down in the 2010s. Like 2000 to 2010, obviously it was out of control. And then it's kind of slowed down in the last 10 years. So there aren't as many to choose from. Yeah, I was, I was really trying to think about that. And I was like, huh. Obviously, there's yeah. a Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. Well, we Which covered that one already. We're so. putting that at the top. Yes, of course. The top of every list. Would you call it a remake or just a no, new I adaptation? Don't. I okay. actually here's the th here's the thing, too, because I sort of struggled with this as well, like with technically calling Let Me In a remake because the original source material for the first movie is a book. Right. So is this technically a remake or is it just a new adaptation? And I struggle with that a lot because like, I think it's, it's a remake. Me, I mean, it is. Like, I think you it know, adopts I mean, a lot of the same visual language as the original. Yeah. I mean, and, I'm, 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 I'm being pretentious with my language choices is essentially what I'm copying to here. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I get it, but I, I don't consider it a remake of the mini series. I consider it a new adaptation of the book. I would agree with that. I and think, I, th I would say it's most, most of the cases with most of the, the, the King movies. Yeah. So, or I would even say with like the, with like the, the Haunting Hill House, like I, I would consider that a new adaptation. Okay. So yeah, it's weird. Like if, I think it was, if you can go back and there's an original source material that comes from like a book, I tend to stay away from the word remake. Okay. Um, but I think maybe in this instance, because it's, uh, hold on a second. I have a dog who is getting on the desk. Get down. Um, he good wants girl. to be on Thank the podcast. She wants to be on yes. the podcast. Yes. Yeah. She's climbing up on Brian's desk. No, yeah. don't do that. Um, but I think, um, yeah, it's weird. Like this is definitely a, a remake, but I would, you could also just call it a new adaptation too, but I don't know if it necessarily does enough to change things up to qualify as a new re a new adaptation or right. like there's miles of difference between it 1990 and it 2017. Right. Or was that 2018? 2017 was the first one, wasn't 2017 it? 2017 was chapter one. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. I was, uh, I don't know. Every year feels the same at this point. Now, so. <laughs> it's all, <laughs> it's all running together. We're, we're all just in the two thousands at this point. And when we get out of it, we'll figure out what year we're in. So yeah. yeah. But yeah, I think, um, you know, in terms of like the, the, the newer ones, I think I put evil dead above that. I think I'd, put child's play above it. I know I'll get grief for that, but I, and I would definitely put Suspiria above it. All right. So, but I mean, I just, I get emotional just thinking about the Suspiria remake. So, you know, I'm a weirdo. What do I know? No, I'm glad that you love it. I do. But I love the original too. So, yeah. and I love that they both exist and they're both so different that they I can are just completely love both. different. Yeah, for sure. So different. Yeah. So that's how you do it, kids. That's how you do it. How about Piranha though? Uh, sure. You know, I would still put this above <laughs> Piranha, but Piranha is really fun. Yeah. I mean, you get Jerry O'Connell's penis in that. So do yeah. you, how, what's the, you know, what's, what's the, the penis factor? In well, Let it, me in, it so. cameos in Let Me In. Oh, that's true. There's that one scene at the, at the school, right? <laughs> yeah. 
airports. You know, it's, it's riding the bus with Owen to school and then, you know, shows up. Well, what do you um, think is in the trunk at the end? Oh, that's that's a big trunk. It's Jerry O'Connell's penis. <laughs> doing well, Morse started. code with Owen. <laughs> Wow, that thing's impressive. Oh, believe me, Rebecca <laughs> Romaine agrees with you. Yeah, I was going to say, she's no dummy. She knows. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that we've ended on a classy note here. As always, such is our way on Horror oh, BFFs. We're so, we're, so, we're so intellectual, aren't we? <laughs> Thank you guys very much for listening. As always, go to DailyDead.com every day for the latest and greatest in horror coverage. Go to CorpseClub.com. To, uh, for past episodes to find out how you too could become a member of the Corpse Club. Thank you to our engineer Brian for his tireless work in making us sound a little bit better and thank you to my horror BFF Heather Wixon for doing this show with me. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Sorry I got all excited about vampires. I'll tone it down next time. Never tone it down. What are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing on the next one? Um, I mean, speaking of Piranha, have we done Piranha? Like, we haven't about done Piranha. Help. Okay, so pr- we we basically have two left. Pr- we just keep pr- putting off. <laughs> I spit on your I grave. Spit on oh your grave. God! <sighs> I mean, we might as well end with that one. So, yeah, all right, I Piranha's guess so. next. It's our it's our stepfather. Uh, all right, so Piranha will be next. We'll see you guys next month for Piranha. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, stay scary.